fourth power. Now, in Don Kuhn's book that came out probably before this book A equals to B, he refers to these things as monsters. Ah, uh -uh. they are very tame, using his, his theory. And so I just think that uh, <coughs> not, I'm not doing this to earn my dinner, okay? I'm saying this because I used to be impressed by Don Kuhn's book, Concrete Mathematics, where he said these are monsters. We have no answers. No one they wrote it forward because he broke the whole thing. And you can sum up very much more complicated things, uh, which Don, who's ever talked in actually, in my mind, didn't have the technology for it. So uh, my point is this, that when you can sum very fancy, uh, complicated expressions into a closed form, that closed form is important because just like, was it Gauss who was asked to add up all the numbers from one to 1,000? And he did it in five seconds, right? And it angered the teacher because he had a closed form, although he cheated in a way by adding the first and last and showed that you know, they were symmetric to the second and second last. But the fact is, closed form expressions, in my mind, are a waste of time. I mean, one of my countrymen, Ramanujan, was an expert in closed form. He found very fancy closed form formulations, like Q series and theta series, mock theta series, whatever. I was never impressed. I always believed that the computer was more important. Because a computer could do things that humans can only uh, formulate. And until the computer exists, things like this were not important mathematically, arithmetically, but important for the algebraic content. That means you try to find closed form expressions for them. So the closed form here refers to being able to put it in a function of an elementary nature. So on table one, uh, we, 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 we start the whole thing. And, and so of course, to compete in R was our preferred choice, although I would have also would have mind, uh, minded writing my own code. Uh, but when I saw that infinite precision com computing requires some pretty elaborate code, and the guy in LA who sold me that program wouldn't tell me how he was done. So I had to read up the book, Error-Free Computation by Krishnamurti and uh, Todd Gregory. And they, they showed how it's done. J just very quickly, it's done by using inter interval arithmetic, what they call the P-Adic numbers. Okay, it's a very powerful technology, and you can actually put every number into a PADIC uh, uh, module, okay, by having three parameters, and then you compute everything using that PADIC representation. Very powerful. But we, we decided to use R because R already had uh, almost infinite precision. And then what we did was we just computed the discrepancy, which is the difference between the Black Scholes value and this value. Makes sense, right? Makes complete sense. And that was what this whole paper is about, to compute the discrepancy. And what, what we found was this. Um, what we found was that whilst the prior work by a lot of people, there must be what, three, four, five hundred papers in this topic, focused almost exclusively on the assumption that if you increase n, the problem goes away. We manipulate all five of the input parameters of an auction and see whether using a unsurpassable number, 10,000, it goes away. And here is rough, roughly the results. The first two tables are not very important. They are for at the money options, where the strike is the stock, the discrepancy increases monotonically with the strike to spot ratio. And the same with standard deviation. This is not important because these parameters don't actually affect the convergence rate. The time to expiration is interesting. It goes down a bit curvilinearly, but it's not an important parameter. What's really important is the spot price. The, the, the spot price is what directs the traffic. And in the case of the spot price, if you have even n at 10,000, you have this oscillatory behavior, which means the, the, the discrepancy doesn't ever go away. The difference between this and this starts to go all over the place. And that, that's a very, very, uh, very wild function, very telling. It doesn't go away even if you increase n indiscriminately. And this is a bit like number theoretic in the sense that in number theory you have the torsion function, or Euler's torsion doesn't ever stabilize. It's fluctuative uh, wildly. And that's why the Riemann hypothesis remain uh, unconquered because the torsion formula, if uh, the Mobius function can be tamed in close form, the, the whole mystery is gone. Uh, and that hasn't been the case. Okay, so this is one function that no matter how you increase n, it stays. And the same with the strike, is for n equals to 10,000. 
And it goes 10,000 requires vectorized code because most computers can't handle that sort of uh, density of the state space. But we pushed it really hard. Uh, we had to devise our own code, we got it. It doesn't go away. In other words, at no point does it appear that there's going to be any smoothing, which means that this is a number theoretic problem. Correctly identified by Joron. It's number theoretic. It's got nothing to do with a probabilistic convergence mechanism, which has never been proved in the first place. What made me see stars was the fact I'm a trained statistician. I got a graduate degree in statistics from Stanford. And I spent many a year thinking about statistics. And this was a number theory. And after I left Stanford, I had fallen in love with the Riemann hypothesis. And I spent six years studying it. And it was all number theory. Now, why do I do these crazy things? Because as Zoran says, I'm a bit of a jack of all trades. You know? mm -hmm. But uh, something smacked me here that this was a number theoretic. In number theory, uh, a million is nothing. Okay? It, you could compute a billion zeros of the zeta function, and you still couldn't solve a Riemann hypothesis. It's, it's not accessible by computer yet. And I keep telling Andrew Abisco that. No? He doesn't like to hear it. Mm -hmm. I, I should be careful what I say, no? because we've had many fight before. No, and well, this doesn't know. Yeah. Surprisingly, he doesn't know why the Riemann hypothesis is true or false. He doesn't know. I, 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 I know. It's I was false. very surprised because yeah, I, I know it's true. I know it's false. <laughs> <laughs> it's completely false, but I'm not ready for it yet. Because when I went to see a big wig in Princeton many years ago and declared it was false, I got kicked out of his office for being a heretic. You mean Sarnak? Huh? Sarnak? No, or me. Uh, <laughs> So he told me to get out of his office, and okay, all right, uh, I'm, I'm not a mathematician, I'm not competing, I'm just a shit stirrer from outside. You know? yeah. But the fact is that I know it's false, no problem, no doubt about it. Uh, but, but that can be talked over dinner. Here, the, the, the thing is that it doesn't converge ever. Something that was assumed that there would be uniform convergence. Now with interest rates, there's a cyclicality, which is interesting, but because the R variable is not that important, I'm going to suppress it. So this is what happens when you keep increasing n. It seems to converge very, very slowly, but actually more things creep up when you go towards 10,000. And the reason for 10,000 is because before our paper, nobody had done more than four or 5,000 because of the computational issue. It was such a drag on the computer. So what do we plan to do with this result? Well, first of all, I, I wanted Doron to vouch that his theorem was correctly modeled by uh, Evangelos. Because Evangelos just did a very couple of simple twists to the hypergeometric and showed that when you do that, the ratio tk plus 1 over tk doesn't exist. And so that's basically uh, saying that the hypergeometric condition is not there. And as you, as you know, if it's not hypergeometric, it doesn't converge. That's it. Uh, now, the fact that it doesn't converge implies this important question. So which one do you take? My current preference is to fix this one. I happen to think that it's tied to the Riemann hypothesis. But like I said, I promise no, no, not too much controversy. Mm -hmm. So we will do that at the right time. And plus, they don't know whether the Riemann is true or not. So we may have another problem. So I might have to be forced to give my solution. You know why I'm afraid of that? If you look carefully at the web, there's a, there's a speech made by the president of CMI, Carlson. He says that if you solve the Riemann, havoc will come the e-commerce world because you can't encrypt it. Uh, I'm, I'm in the process of writing to him, because if you can't encrypt using the RSA prime factorization, you can still encrypt using non-RSA methods, you know, like integer ring theory methods, or what they call elliptical crypt. No, uh, elliptical ECC, right? Yeah. There are I mean, many other ways. But the Yemen also is not related to RSA. It's something different. Uh, if it's true, yes. If it's true, I agree. But because mine is false, I'm actually yeah. absolved of it. But when, when, when that thing came out, when Jim Carlson wrote that, I was warned by some people, stay clear of the Riemann. I was mean, even told to double, triple bolt my doors at home and work offline. Mm -hmm. Talk about a paranoia, okay? So there was a book about a crypto by Stephen Levy, where he said that Ralph Merkel never had anyone pointing a poison tip umbrella at him, see? So there's no need to be paranoid. So six years later, I've now started to single bolt my doors. And I'm thinking of working online because my computers are more powerful on the cloud. But at the same time, six years ago, I was paranoid, okay? Because look at the movie, Sneakers, right? What happened to the guy? He got killed. The mafia killed him, no? So Doron, that's why I switched to NP versus P. Because that one, 
The upside is 95%. The downside is that you might mess up the crypto world. And as Sanjay Arora says so beautifully in his book, Computational Complexity. Sorry folks, we just have to learn how to live without e-commerce. So there's a bright side to it. I tell, always tell, this I've got to be careful on this one. I tell my wife, if I break RSA, it means that I cannot have an affair because you will be able to break into my mm -hmm. files and you will kill me. So because of fear of loss of life, I will not have an affair. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to have no e-commerce. You'll find another way. You can always tie the, your, your, your handcuff your hand to the briefcase or go back to homing pigeons now. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, if you can crack this one, which is not NP complete, but it's up there, as it's called PPAD complete, factory. Uh, you can actually uh, do a lot of things. And so I decided to go for a full enchilada, and B equals to P. And that's my, my current target. But this one is something which gave me uh, a lot of practice. How much time do you have? Yeah, Six minutes. Okay, good. So the big picture is this. As you know, Hadi Ramanujan had the hey, same problem. Maybe not to mention. Uh, I don't know. I, I won't talk about it. I'll just put it there to okay. annoy you a bit. Okay. <laughs> but. Uh, with Ramanujan Hadi, they had the incredible additive part uh, partition formula in the 1920s. And that was a stroke of genius, okay? How they did it, it was all in George Andrews' book. And it was 30 pages to prove it in his full gl glory. Roddy Marker comes in and does five pages. Why? Because he transforms the path to include a dissection that's incredibly simple, the Fari dissection. And that's because the convergence methods uh, adopted was such that Ramanujan Hadi never converged. It was asymptotically correct. It was, if, if, if it was made uh, an integer value, it was correct. But it didn't have the convergence properties. So it has come up before. And I, I thought I'd mention it because of the fact that, uh, you know, in, in, in number theory, convergence is important. A series that converges or diverges is important. So the path choice of convergence is important. In Radi Marker, he had the four sense to pick the Ferry dissection, which is totally appealing to me. I worked a long time in the Faraday series to know that those series are the correct uh, way to represent the reals. Uh, Gigman Skorohod and Kushner had these very high-powered papers that people take to be the gospel truth, that Markov chains converge to um, diffusions. And the idea of lattice was as continuous as Doron brought up. That's the central question. Which one do you pick? Uh, Yitzhak Kelt Nelson, who taught me uh, advanced analysis at Stanford, always told me, no matter how you look at it, if you use a cycle, it's always a hole there. Mm -hmm. And this whole problem arises here because between the cracks, it slips through. See? The cracks. And the cracks never go away, no matter how you uh, fractalize it. You, even if you go to the 10,000 steps, there's always a crack. So, a famous chapter in the book by uh, Mumford on fractal theory, slipping between the cracks, the devil's fat case problem. Mm -hmm. So, do Markov chains converge or ask? No, they don't. And, and Kushner, Gigman, Skorohod, big names. Uh, I, do I want to go after them? You know, Doron, when you go after big names, you get whacked, you know? I, I know that because I have a paper with the Nobel laureate where we went after some big names. And lucky he was there to protect me, else I'd be a dead man now. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm tired of uh, taking on people who don't like to be told they're wrong. No one likes to be told they're wrong. But gosh, can you beat that? Doron has opened a can of worms. Thanks to you, Doron. Thanks. Now, I brought in these two because although I said I won't talk about it, they come right smack into the whole thing. Now, a topic that I can talk a little bit about is automated theorem proving. Now here, I do believe I will get Doron's sympathy because he has spoken well of the computer packages. I've always been a complete believer in computer assist. And I always cite this when I write to people like Peter Sonic, saying that Euler got it wrong. Euler got it wrong because when he proved that four cortex couldn't sum to a fifth, he thought he was so sure, and yet, Landis and Perkins. I mean, he, he conjectured it. He but you know, when you make a false conjecture, you lose some reputation. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I think so. That's why I don't make conjectures too yeah. easily. Yeah, but you have a bone in conjectures. Yeah, but uh, you know, a fool can make conjectures. Yeah. And uh, people make conjectures. And Euler got this one wrong. He also got the Greco Latin square conjecture wrong. So there's two stripes. Three in his out, you know. <laughs> So making conjectures is cheap, especially after you become a big name, you want to conjecturalize. But when computer assist came in, all these conjectures were toppled. And I, I make a conjecture now. And this is dangerous, okay? Mm. Fermat's last theorem is wrong. <laughs> because I think if you go to 10 to the 10 to the 10, you'll find a counterexample. 
But we can't get there yet because we just don't know how to compute at that level. But that, here again, of my three conjectures, if I get two right, I still am doing okay, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to talk about dinner about why I think FLT is wrong. But uh, like I promised, there are nothing controversial here. Although this, you realize this is very controversial, okay? Mm -hmm. In finance, I have had a lot of people spit at me because they don't want to see the lattice models go down. So it means that it falls on my shoulders now to resolve this now. And I think to resolve this, you need to get to this. I'll give you a hint there. How does the two connect? Well, six years of the, Re of the Riemann hypothesis, uh, after mucking around the RH for six years, I think I know where the problem is. So unfortunately, the Riemann has to be somehow uh, dealt with. Now, that's a millennium level problem, OK? NP versus P, that's, that's too big, OK? Maybe in 10 years' time, I'll come back and I will, to much fanfare, uh, declare it. I'll tell you why uh, these two are different also. Is that yeah. almost up? You said seconds. Seconds. So basically, uh, we have some very good things in finance. And thanks to Doron, he's opened a can of worms, and I intend to see whether it's a dead can or a, and a live can. Thank you, Doron. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> They have the great to answer questions in private, and if you'd like to join us for dinner, uh, you're most welcome.